Bible, and it is time for Bible study. It's an opportunity to be with you today and to share with you the Word of God. We want to apologize for being late today. Uh, it is uh, my desire and the desire of all of us here is to be punctually on time. So I want to uh, ask your forgiveness for us starting at this lateness of the hour. Uh, we ran into some situations that we had to work out. But nevertheless, we're here, and uh, we are trusting that you are, are, are going to be blessed of the Word of God today. I'm going to be sharing the Word from the subject, The Life You Live. And it's going to take us into um, an array of scriptures and uh, I want you to just allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into your understanding of the word as we uh, lay out the scriptures by the unction of the Holy Ghost, that your heart and your mind will be enriched in God. Father, in Jesus name, I just pray, Lord God, that you will lead and that you will guide the, us as we go forth in this lesson, Lord God. And we pray, God, for those that are watching, those that are uh, online with us. We pray, God, that you will give them clarity today, that their hearts will be uh, uh, in the, enlightened to what you want and your purpose and your will for their lives. And Father, we pray for the lost today, those that are not saved, those that don't know you. We pray, God, that even those that are not saved, if they should hear this word, that it will spark uh, a desire in their heart to want to know you as their Savior. So, Father, we just worship you today in the word, and we just thank you as we present ourselves before you, that you might do what is pleasing in your honor sight and we give you the glory we give you honor we bless you for all things in Jesus mighty name amen well bless the Lord I'm going to be sharing with you this word today on the life you live and it's coming from this this uh, perspective that takes us from the beginning of, of man being created all the way into the new man that God has created us to be. And so we're going to go into the scriptures, but I want you to understand something here, that there are, there are no gray areas in the scripture. There are no gray areas in truth. A an issue is either true or it is false. It is either holy or it's unholy. It's godly or it's ungodly. It's saved or it's lost. It's heaven or hell. There are no in-between. And so when we get into trouble as, as we minister the gospel, many times we get in trouble when we try to read between the lines because the scripture is profoundly absolute. There are no gray areas in the scripture. So I want to share something with you today that the Holy Spirit has been in, embedding and, and, and unctioning from my heart uh, this word uh, regarding uh, the life you live. Because just as, just as we have stated that the word of God is absolute. It is absolute in every aspect. So that means now that the aspect of the word that comes to me as an individual and whatever that word says about me, that also is absolute. Okay, that also is absolute. So it doesn't matter what my brother think or my sister think or my mom or my dad or the people on the job or the people that I'm in church with or the people, you know, that that I interact with. It doesn't matter what all of them think. Now, if God is not approving of me, the life that you live. OK, I remember growing up uh, hearing um, a couple that was in the gospel artists. They are called the consolers. 
And the consolers pinned a song. And the song was, may the works I've done speak for me. In other words, I mean, I, I, I could testify with my lips, but I want the works that I've done. I want the life that I have lived speak for me. Okay, and so I want us to realize that in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about that, but it's coming from a whole, uh, a wholeness perspective, okay? And by that, I mean the beginning of man all the way into the new life. So get ready to take a journey with us into the scripture because the word of God has to have preeminence in every aspect of our lives. And so I just want to bless the Lord. And I just say, Lord God, make sure that I, I want to make sure that my heart is pure and that my, my hands are clean and that my, that, you know, that I'm sanctified and that I am a yielded vessel that God, you can speak through. So I want to take us to a scripture first. Though. And I'm going to do something later on, but I want to, right now I want to take us to a scripture. Let's go to the beginning and let's look at, um, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis, the second chapter. And let's look at this verse. We've heard it uh, many, many a times in, in, in Christ. And, uh, you know, we've, we, it's one of the ones that we learn uh, early on in life. Uh, Genesis 2 and 7 is dealing with the creation and, and it, of man. And so the scripture says now, that it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And God then breathed into his nostrils. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God formed man and what did he form him of see that word that little preposition there of is giving us an identity as to what made up what was the substance of man what substance was used to make man so let's understand this now because he was made of the dust of the ground. Okay? And then it says, and then after that, God breathed into his nostril, and man became, or he breathed in his nostril the breath of life. And I don't want to run over that breath of life because I want you to understand this here clearly, because I know for uh, a few years, as I started my Christian walk, you know, this has been a, a, a decades ago, but a few years for the first six, seven, eight, nine years, 10 years, you know, I've taught that, that as I was walking in God and I saw this word and I, I always took this to be the Holy Spirit that was breathed into Adam. And my friend, that is not the truth. And it doesn't matter how I try to make it sound like it, the breath of life is the Holy Spirit. That's just not the truth. Because God already qualified what made up man. And he's going to qualify it again and again and again throughout the scripture. So I was teaching this as being the Holy Spirit. But this can't be the Holy Spirit because even Jesus said the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. So this was, told, this was just a, an error on my learning, an error. And this was a like of following the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to tell you something about this. I'm going to talk to you today, and I want you to understand something here. That for years, I taught this here, and it was evident that God wasn't teaching. And every, I say this to every minister today. Everyone, whenever you teach something 
that has any error in it. That is a manifestation that the Holy Ghost is not leading you. It doesn't matter. You know, people say, well, I just, you know, I, I made a mistake. Well, the Holy Ghost don't make mistakes. People say, well, I didn't get it right. Well, the Holy Ghost never gets it wrong. So I was simply just wrong on this, and I, there's no way I could reconcile this passage now to all the other passages of Scripture. You know, and I got a, an abundance of Scripture here. So I'm going to talk about this. God breathed in the man the breath of life, which is simply the wind. So man, after having been formed from the dust of the ground, after having God breathed into his nostril the breath of life, when that man became a living soul. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about two. Um, we're going to talk about man before salvation, and we're going to talk about man after salvation. I lived a certain way. Before salvation, and those of you that are getting this broadcast, I want you to think in your heart and mind about something. I want you to think about if there was no change in the way I live after salvation, what is the whole essence and purpose of salvation? I want you to think about that. Because there's a doctrine that is got, uh, has got its roots in the body of Christ. That is saying that we're all God's children and that is saying that you're, you know, you're going to be saved. All you got to do is, you know, just accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And that I, my friend, I don't refute that at all. You do have to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You do have to confess him with your mouth. You do have to believe from your heart, no matter what preachers say, that's what you have to do. Why? Because that's what the scriptures say. But let's go with this man before he got saved. What, why did man need to be saved? Why did we need to be born again? Why do we need to change our lifestyle changed the way we once was living. Why was there ever a need for that? Well, let's look at this here. Let's look at this here now. God breathed in his nostril. He became a living soul. And God gave Adam and Eve some commandments. God gave them some commandments. And he told them uh, that there was a tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they were not to touch it and they were not to eat from it. And God told them, he said, the day that you eat of this tree, you shall die. The day that you eat from this tree, you shall die. Now, I know there's a lot of different schools of thought about that statement right there. But again, again, the word of God is absolute. And one of the things that God is teaching us, God is saying through this word, he wasn't a God now that made a statement and that statement had to be reinterpreted by me or you or anyone else, you know, God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree. Let's just see. Can we pull that scripture up? Because that is that's that's one of the uh, things that hinges on the, the, the what brought man to a place that we are in need of a new birth. And a new life, a whole new way, a whole new way. Now, look what he says in verse 15, ver uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 15. I believe that's where I'm at here. Yes, chapter 3, verse 15 said, but of the fruit 
of the tree, which is the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. That's what God said. Okay, God, God, they, 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 they understood what God said. And God said, you, 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 you can't do it. Now, now look what, he, in, in verse 3, that's a good one, right? Good verse right there, uh, Genesis 3 and 3. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, Adam and Eve understood clearly what God said, and, and they re they recited it back. Uh, Eve was able to recite it back. And so now we see moving forward that they disobeyed God. And when Adam disobeyed God, the spirit of iniquity, the spirit of the devil was able to have access, entrance into Adam. And something happened. So let's look at our, uh, our natural man and our spiritual man, because I'm not going to have uh, all the time. But I want us to see this here in the light of the old man that God created. And this is what God created in Genesis 2 and 7. God created a man that had a body. You and I. In the similitude of Adam had a body and in that body that body was just laying down it had no life in it it could not move it could not express anything so I want you to see here that the body never does anything of itself the body never does anything of itself. It has no ability to do nothing of itself. So that's what God created. And that body was just laying there, limp, no movement, no expressions, no anything. Then God breathed into that body some wind. And in doing so, man, this man, became a living soul. And through this soul now, he was able to give expressions. Because the soul now is living in this body. So now that the soul is living in this body... The soul now can look through these eyes and see. Take these hands and touch. Take the feet and begin to move because the soul is what tells the body what to do. Okay, the body doesn't just jump up and start doing things on its own. No, the soul tells the body what to do. Everything that the body does, everything that the body was doing, came from the soul and was expressed through the body. So your body now has no mind of its own. If your body has no mind of its own, it can have no expressions of its own. So don't ever think your body is what's causing you to sin. Don't ever think your body is what's causing this action. Because your body causes no action of itself. It has to be instructed. It has to be uh, empowered by a substance other than itself. And in this case of the natural man, it's the soul. Now, let me show you the difference because a lot of times we're talking about, well, well, I'm saved and, and this person is, is, is wondering how, do, how, do, how did this all uh, move forward and we go from here to this new man. Because I want you to see in this case, this is an, just a, 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 an example of one that is born again. One that is born again. So what we have here, we have a body. The body is still there. 
Uh, we still got a body. And then what else do we have? We have the Holy Spirit. See, we have a soul. So we have the soul here. We have the Holy Spirit here and we have the body. So what's different about this? Let's go back over here. The body is right next to the soul. The soul is touching the body. That's why we live in this house. See, this is the life right here. And this is the house. So we live the soul in this house, the body. See, so that's what, that's where we are. So when I want to do something, I tell my body, take me over there to that podium. And my body just start taking me over there. My body don't say, oh, no, I'm not going to take you over there. Get somebody else to take you over there. No, I tell my body what to do. I tell my body to close my eyes and it just close them. I tell my hands to wave and it just wave. I tell my feet to move and they just move. They don't resist what my soul, see, is telling them to do because they have no expressions of themselves. They have absolutely none. So your body never makes you do anything. See, so we are living in this body. So now let's talk a little about this. The soul is the seat of all of our emotions. That's that's what that's where our appetites are. The soul houses all of our appetites. That's where they are. So if you are a, a, a sinner, I was a sinner. I was a sinner because my appetite was sinful. Mm hmm. That's what made me a sinner. My appetite was sinful. The things that I love was sinful. The, the, the things that I do or did were sinful. That's why the scripture can declare all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because we were soul under sin. We were born and shaped in iniquity. This soul come into us now from the first Adam Filled with iniquity, filled with iniquity, and therefore it is alienated from God, and therefore it is anti-God. And so that's why we can take so we can so easily go after the things of the world, so easily have an affection for the world and live that life for years and years and years and years, because that's our appetite. That's all from the soul. But that's not spiritual. I need you to understand this. There is nothing about this man here that is spiritual. Now, if you don't understand that, you're going to be missing something. Because a lot of scholars have tried to make this man spiritual to fit the ideology that he died a spiritual death here. But he's not spiritual. I'm going to take you through the scripture that says he is not spiritual, but he is natural. And nothing about this man is spiritual. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. He doesn't have a, 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 a consecrated body now. He does. All of this is sinful. Now, let's go to a scripture. And then we're coming right back to the board. But let's go to a scripture in the book of uh, Corinthians for a moment, because Corinthians will tell us also in first Corinthians chapter two, first Corinthians chapter two and verses 14. And maybe the, we might even get to 15th and 16th verse. But first Corinthians chapter 14 said, but the natural man, that's what this is, guys. See, we got to say the scripture either absolute or we got another gray area. The natural man receiveth not, huh? Not the things of the spirit of God. Now, if a natural man, which is this man, cannot receive the things of the spirit of God, there is absolutely no way this man can have the spirit. There's no way that this man can be living a spiritual life. And before you die a spiritual death, 
You've got to first be living a spiritual life. See, but that's impossible. Oh, bless you, Jesus. That's impossible here. The natural man is not of the spirit. A natural man don't bear the image of the spirit. He bears the image of the substance from which he was made. So here's what the, the apostle says. He cannot receive the things of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Now listen to this. He can't be spiritual if he can't even know the spiritual things. See, God makes his word so, so absolute that when your child is reading it, they'll, they'll look up and say, that person don't know God. That person can't know God unless they be born again because the scripture says they're foolishness to him. And he can't even know them because they are spiritually discerned. Let me show you here. There is nothing in this capacity. There's nothing. Listen to me. Listen to it. There's nothing in this capacity of the natural man that can discern spiritual things. So, so that's what the scripture is telling us. He can't know them. They, he, just, he, he just can't. He can't receive them and he can't know them. So now that's what that scripture tells us. Let's go somewhere else now. And because Jesus said something, let's go to Mark chapter. Uh, let's, well, let's go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17. Because we're talking about this man right here and, and, and the life that we live. If we live, Apostle Mike ministered last night, or Apostle, uh, Apostle uh, Kamadi ministered last night. And he's talking about the identity, you know. And, 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 and let me say something. Everything about this man here identifies as flesh. Everything about him. See, you can't mix it up. You can't mix it. You know, Apostle Banks uh, had, she coined the phrase, don't mix the manner. She coined that phrase. Well, you need to just keep on regurgitating, regurgitating that over and over and over. Don't mix the manner. Either it is or it is not. See, and th there's nothing about him that is spiritual. Absolutely nothing. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Look what this scripture says in Matthew 9 and 17. I want you to go with me there because I have to allow the scripture to talk. Jesus is talking, teaching, preaching, just showing the truth. And he says, neither do men put wine into old bottles. Now he's using these analogies here. The wine is the Holy Ghost. Huh? That's the wine. The wine is, is signifying the Holy Ghost, representing that. This is the old bottle, it's the old man. And Jesus is teaching us you can't house the Holy Ghost. If you haven't been born again, because the only way the Holy Ghost is coming in is through the new birth. So you can't hold or contain spiritual things as long as you are in this natural makeup. See, so look what he says. God didn't say it, but this, this is what it says. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. The bottles perish. That's the body. He said, you can't, can't do that. This body, except it changes, cannot house the Holy Spirit. There is no way the Holy Spirit is going to come into this body unless God do an operation that changes this body. 
There's no way he's going to do it. So he says now, the break is perished, but they put new wine into new bottles. See, they put new wine into new bodies. That's, that sounds like salvation coming here. That sounds like a new life. That's why we don't live, those of us that are sons of God, the life that we live, we're charged with that life now. Oh, bless you, Jesus. I said we are charged with that life now. Why? Because before I was in captivity, I couldn't help but sin. Which, but now, now all the things that I do since salvation, I'm going to have to be given account of. Because I've been made free. See? I, I can do it now. I can live it now. Now, let's look at something here. And I'm going to go from this here. Let's, let's go to another word because I want you to see this and we're going to run a little bit today. This man here can never make it to heaven in this state. This man here can never please God in this state. Now you say, well, Bishop Jones, sounds like you, 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 you're being a little bit this, a little bit that. Listen, what the scripture says. We, we read the scripture last night. Let me go to it again. The Holy Spirit just give me this word. And let's go to the book of Romans for a moment. Romans, and let's look at uh, chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And let's see what the scripture is going to tell us. The scripture says in Romans chapter 8 and uh, the 8th verse, it says, Romans 8 and 8. Now, I love the way the scripture lay this out. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So therefore, this man is in the flesh, and it is impossible for him to please God. Why? Because God has condemned sin in the flesh. God has said, no flesh shall glory in my presence. God has said, we are no longer to know any man after the flesh. Because the flesh cannot please God. Okay? So that's Romans 8 and 8. Now, Jesus says, that means the word say, which is Jesus, but I just want to be more just direct. The word in the same chapter, read it again last night, and uh, the uh, 14th verse of chapter 8 of Romans says these words, for as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God. Come on, Zion. Come on, Zion. Let's, let's look at this. <coughs> for as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God. Does this man have the Holy Spirit? Somebody can answer that. Answer it. Does this man have the Holy Spirit? The answer is a resounding no. Why? Because everything about him is earthy. Everything that it took to make him up is earthy. He has no spiritual life. Oh, but God says, I'm going to preserve. God said, you know, in the Garden of Eden, when they sinned, God, God said, I'll make you some coats. I'm not going to accept your own 
making of fig leaves and whatnot, but I'm going to make you some coats because I'm going to cover you and I'm going to preserve you. I'm going to preserve you for my purpose. You know, Apostle Banks has been talking about something and it's just, you know, I don't talk much about it. Uh, I hear and I listen and I see what God is saying. I hear what God is saying. And let me tell you something. God is never going to be outdone. God says, I know how to preserve man and punish man at the same time. I know how to be upset with man or be disappointed with man, but keep him. Oh, bless you, Jesus. And God wrote off the whole human race. He wrote off all of this Adamite creature and said, I'm still going to preserve this body and I'm going to still bring forth my plan what I plan before the foundation of the world I'm bringing him forth look what he says here he can't please God because he has no spirit he doesn't have the spirit of God so he can't please God and that's what the scripture says those that are in the flesh cannot please him now there was a time that we were in the flesh, okay? Now, we've heard these scriptures over and over, and I, I could go on and on and give a lot more scriptures. Uh, we've heard them over and over, but let's hear them again. There was a time when we were in the flesh, because we said those that are in the flesh can't please God. So let's go back and see what Romans chapter 7 and verse 5, it tells us, it says, for verse 5, it says, for when... Romans 7 and 5, we'll, we'll go there first. And, 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 and this word said, for when we were, I want you to see the operative word here. The operative word is when we were in the flesh. That means that we are not saved. That means that from Adam, from the creation of the first man up to this time, man still didn't have the Holy Ghost in him until salvation. And so he wasn't spiritual until salvation. He wasn't, he wasn't half natural and half spiritual. That's not what the scripture said. He didn't have a natural body and a spiritual body in him in the same house. That's not what the scripture said. The scripture said the first man was natural. The first man was earthy and he was made of the dust of the ground. That's this man right here. That's him. Can't please God. He's still alienated from God. He's still lost. He's still on a fast track course to hell fire. He's still eternally lost. He can be the most mannerable person in the world. He can be the most humble minded person in the world. He can be the most decent moral person in the world. But this man is on his way to hell and saints of God we've got to stand forth and we've got to tell men and women that you, your being good is not good enough. Your being morally right is not good enough. Your being respectful is not good enough. You've got to be born again. You've got to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. and you, Otherwise, you'll never be able to please God. You'll never be able to experience the liberty of God, of the faith. You'll never be able to do so. Now, let's look. That's that, that's that man. All of us are guilty. All of us are guilty in him. All of us have sinned and come short. Can't nobody stand here and boast, well, I never know you're lying. You did. I did. You didn't. All of us have. But that, that's not the point. The point is that God sent an answer. Because this is not where he closed the chapter. This is not where he left off. So now when I was over here, when I was able, when I was out whoremonging, well, that's because that was my appetite over here. When I was out thieving, that's because my appetite for theft was over here. When I was out being mean spirited and arrogant and proud and heady and high minded, all of those were my appetites because what? Satan had taken over my soul. I was in captivity. 
When you're in captivity, you don't decide how it goes. When you're in captivity, you do what another person wants you to do. You do the will of somebody else, not your own. And the devil have convinced many people that you're just doing your own thing. You're not doing your own thing. Sin is a crafty fighter. You're not doing your own thing. But Satan has many in captivity and their emotions is his emotions. Their desires is his desires. That's why Jesus stood in the sanctuary, stood in the marketplace and say, ye are of your father the devil and his lust will ye do because you can't help it. Because you love him. You can't help it because you're in bondage to him. You can't help it because you're a slave to him. Oh, bless you, Jesus, but the day is gone for man being a slave to the devil because you can come out of slavery. You can come out of captivity. You can come out of bondage because the door, which is Jesus Christ, has come and opened it wide and he's standing and said, I'll bring you out. All you got to do is now desire to come out as the apostle was describing in Romans chapter 7 that I delight in the inward man to obey him, but I just can't find myself doing it. Don't have the strength. Don't have the power. And God says, I'll give you the strength. I'll give you the power. I'll give you. All you got to do is create a hunger. All you got to do is create a thirst. All you got to create a desire. And say, I want to come out now. Oh, the door has come. Oh, bless you, Jesus. This man. See him? See him? That's who we were. I said, that's who we were. Now, let me go to another scripture real quick, because we're going to be here just a little bit longer. We were late starting and apologize for that, but I'm not cutting short right here. Let's go to the word in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And let's start at verse 17 and 18. Those two verses of scripture. I remember sitting in a, a jail cell and hearing Ron Don minister this word 50 some years ago. And it just blessed my heart. But Romans chapter 6 and uh, let's go. Yeah, 16. That's, that, that's good. Boy, pastor, that's all right right there. Because look at this verse 16. Know ye not. In other words, are you, are, you, are you into the no? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. In other words, I now have a choice. I know we don't like to think that we do, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to show God that we really love him. If we did have a choice, if we didn't have an option, see, you can't show God you love him if there's nothing to oppose that. So he said, now, whom ye yield yourself service to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. So now, when I was this natural man, there was no need for me to yield because I was in captivity. I was in slavery. I was in bondage. No yield. So who is he talking about here? He's talking about this regenerated. He's talking about this man right here. The one now that, that God did an operation of God. In other words, he, he slew this body. He took this soul out of this body. That's what God did. And when the soul leaves the body, the body dies. Remember when God created Adam? He formed him from the dust of the earth and the man laid there no life at all. He didn't have any life until the soul to the wind of God was breathed into his nostril and he became a living soul. But when this soul leaves the body, 
The body ain't walking around on the earth with no soul. The body ain't talking to you with no soul. The body ain't looking at you with no soul. The body is not doing nothing without the soul because it has absolutely no expression, no power of itself. It's just a house. So God came and took the soul out of this house. Uh, you see that? God came and took the soul out of this house. Took the soul out of this house and said, well, well, it's time to get a, it's time to, it's changed the, the residency here. It's time to evict that slave master. Oh, bless you, Jesus. And so he took the soul out and put the soul in the Holy Ghost. Put the soul in the Holy Ghost. I, I wanted to do all kinds of things to show you all of these steps and all of these phases. I wanted to go through a lot of different things to show up, but I can't do all that now. But the fact is that God took the soul out of the body and he placed the soul in the Holy Ghost and then he placed the Holy Ghost with the soul in the Holy Ghost in the body. And before he did that, he consecrated this body. And this whole operation is called the circumcision of Christ. That's the operation of God. Where he circumcised this body. He, this body literally died. And this body was, was, uh, was, was sanctified. And this soul was put in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost was put back in this body. And now... Over here in the natural man, the soul was touching the body. But over here in the new man, the Holy Ghost is touching the body. So now the body is consecrated. The body is sanctified. And the soul is here. Now I'm going to tell you something really, really quick here. Really quick. And you got to get it. You got to get it really quick. Everything you do. You and I, the life that I live, everything I do, guess what? It's still coming out of the soul. The choice is coming out of here. But it, 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 it's, it's influenced by the Holy Ghost. And the only way, the only way now that it does not do that that is pleasing to God is that from my soul, I override the Holy Spirit. There is no time that I'm sinning and the Holy Spirit says nothing. Come on, Zion, stop going that way. There's no time. Listen, the Holy Ghost is bigger than Jerome Jones. The Holy Ghost is bigger than the prophet, bigger than the apostle, bigger than all the churches together. When you sin, the Holy Ghost instantly will say, that's wrong. Don't do that. You just got to abide in him. Oh, bless you, Jesus. You just got to abide in him. So don't, don't think that, this, that God is buying all these excuses, but I just didn't know that was wrong. God said, wait a minute, I'm the Holy Ghost. I know everything. That's what we said last day. The Holy Ghost knows everything. He doesn't have to learn nothing. He does not say, well, I got to go pray about this and I'll come back and tell you later. That's not the Holy Ghost. You, you and I, the life that we live. Listen, I'm talking about the life that you live. You got to live a life that the Holy Ghost is in communion with you. You got to live a life where the Holy Ghost is in communion with you all during the day. And you are in communion with the Holy Ghost all during the day. So it doesn't matter who says what when the Holy Ghost is in communion with you. And you are in communion with the Holy Ghost. When Joe says the wrong thing, the Holy Ghost going to say, don't do that. When Susie said the wrong thing, the Holy Ghost going to say, that's not me. But we are like the Holy Ghost is this dumbfounded person that knows absolutely nothing. And his only way he can talk is that he pick up a Jerome Jones and say something. Listen, there was no Jerome Jones around. There was no man around when God swung out and made the earth, heavens and the earth. No man counseled him. 
No man instructed him. God don't need me at all. And the moment I start thinking that God needs me, I'm in the snare of the devil, and so is everyone else. Because the word of God is profoundly absolute. Now, let's look at here. I love this because now the soul is here, but it is touching. It's in the Holy Ghost. So that's why you hear us say sometimes that our emotions are now to be the emotions of Christ. That's why you say, I see here saying our affections now are now the affections of Christ. But look at the scripture. Don't, don't take my word for it. Just look at the scripture. I, you know, I've I just been doing this. I just started this 50 some years ago. And, it, and, and, and when you think about it, I'm finding out that there's so much more that I don't know. There's a whole lot more that I don't know than what I do know. Look at this. The soul is now in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is never going to usurp. The Holy Spirit is never going to usurp his will over your choice. Again, this black here is the body. The body does nothing. The body don't have no say about it. The body don't tell you, well, go do this. You feel like there's a burning in your heart and you got this lust for this woman or this lust for this guy and your body telling you to go do it. No, the body's not telling you to do nothing. That's the appetite that has been created in the soul. And if you are born again, if you are born again, you created that lust. See, you created that lust and because you created that lust, but there's no lust in the spirit. huh? There's no lust in the spirit. So now you got that lust in your soul. Huh? You got that lust in your soul, but there's no way for you to fulfill it. There's no way for you to fulfill it. So what you have to do, why? Because you are in the Holy Ghost. So what you have to do now, you have to override the Holy Ghost and take your body now and carry out that lustful act that you created in your soul. You have to do it. Now, let me tell you what God says about that. Let me give you a scripture right quick, because some of us that are saved, we may not believe. We not be may not believe that it is important Huh? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Some of us that are saved, we may not believe. I'm just, I'm just saying. We may not believe that to be the case. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses uh, 1 and 2. Uh, that's where we want to go. And I'm coming back to Romans chapter 6 and I'm going to wrap it up right there, I believe. And I say that very reluctantly, but I believe. But let's go to, uh, look what it says. Having therefore these promises. I love this. I love it. I love it. That's talking to the sons of God. That's not talking to, see, if, if we want, if we want to bring uh, others into the kingdom, then we've got to shine as lights in the midst of darkness. Look what he said. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Who is he talking about here? The apostle didn't exclude himself. He didn't say, well, y'all. But he said, let us cleanse ourselves. Now, this person over here, this natural man, he can't clean himself. He can't. He can't clean himself. He's locked up in prison. I don't care how much you want to get out until somebody opened the door. You can't get out. So he's not taught. This scripture is not talking about him. Because if this man try to clean himself up, that's still dead works. See, you're not saved by the righteousness of men. That's just dead works. So the scripture in Corinthians 7 and 1, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, it said, let us. The man that has been born again, 
soul living in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost and the soul is in this body. So he said, let us cleanse ourselves from what? All filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. Oh, bless you, Jesus, in the fear of the Lord. You know, that, that scripture is just so resoundingly effective in the heart of a son of God that's walking in purity. He's saying, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. See, he's saying, you don't, this body, don't let it, don't join it to a harlot now. Don't, don't, don't take it into sin. That's what he's telling us. He said, don't have these lustful appetites in your spirit, in your soul, because the Holy Spirit is just going to guide you into truth. Never will he lead you into sin. Never will he lead you into error. And sons of God, this man, this, we are long ways from finishing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this part right here. Don't have the luxury of, of tea. It would take another hour to, 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 to just really do justice to, to the scripture. We haven't even gotten to scriptures like John 10 and 10 and, and uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 27, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, Ephesians 2 and 5, and Colossians 2, 12, and Colossians 3, 1 through 3, and 1 John 3, 1 and 6, scripture after scripture. But we're going to do a part two because we need to know how to live here. And one of the first things that I want to le leave with you in this lesson <coughs> that is important for the child of God from day one, the first thing when you are translated from being a natural man to being a spiritual man, it's incumbent from you incumbent upon you that day to follow after the Spirit, to walk after the Spirit. And John 16 and 13 says, How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. God bless you today. And I hope you've gotten something out of this. We're going to try to do a, a, a follow up to this word because I just believe. I, I know God gave it. And I know God is doing it. And I want you to know today. That you are a new creature if you're born again. You're not of this world. And you're not indebted to the world. We're sons of the living God. And we're to live unto him. Not unto ourselves, but we're to live unto him. There's no compelling sin that's ruling and reigning over the sons today. So let's give our hearts over to the word of God. And let's allow him to direct us in all things. I hope you've been blessed today. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I just thank you for the sons of God. I thank you for your word. And Father, we've done what you've given us the grace to do. We know that there's so much more to be said from this subject. But that's on, up to you, Father. That's up to you. We come to do your will. We don't come to do what we want to do. We come to do what you tell us to do. And so when you say stop now, we stop now. Time has come. Time has gone. And God, you are the master of all time. So we just pray that you will even take this word and embed it into the hearts of your people. 
Those that are saved enrich them. Those that are not saved cause them to have a hunger and thirst that they might cry out and say, what must I do to be saved? Father, we love you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, glory to God. Glory to God. I'm going to ask you to worship God with us in your giving. Uh, we're going to ask you that uh, here on the broadcast today, uh, you know, we got much to do. We got World Conference coming up and uh, we need your help to even get to the conference. And uh, so we're asking you to worship God and help us get there. And if you want to uh, give something special just for the team to get to the World Conference, we need that help from you today. Uh, talk to the other members of the body of Christ and let's come together because we're one body and let's be a blessing. The, the giving links are on the screen and the cash app is dollar sign MB Global Church. That's dollar sign MB Global Church. The donor box is marybanks.net forward slash give. And then don't forget, you can also get the Bible Teachers uh, app. Uh, you can get your app at thebibleteacher.com. And uh, all of your giving helps us to uh, continue to spread the gospel here and around the world. And as I said, we got World Conference coming up in Leesburg, and we want to encourage you to help uh, the team. Uh, you know, we're your ministers. We are your pastors and uh, we are your servants. And so we're asking you to help the ministers, uh, the team to get down to Leesburg, Florida and uh, to have this great gathering there. I hope to speak to you again soon. I'm Bishop Jerome Jones. And until the very next time, I'm saying to viewers here and around the world, if you go with God, I know that God will surely go with you. And until the next time, you do now by all means have yourself a Jesus-filled day. God bless you and we love you.